Jesus, it is so good to have access to your presence. It is so good to hear the invitation from your scripture that says, therefore, come boldly to the throne of God where we can receive grace and help in our time of need. It's just so good to be with you, Jesus. And I, I guess I want to start by admitting that I, I didn't come to you and I can't come to you because I've, I'm, I'm somehow, I've impressed you or I've behaved in a way that's earned me some right to be here. Oh, Lord, the beauty, the humble beauty of this is that I come on, I come because of you. I've been given free access, upgraded to first class because of your merit, because of who you are. And Lord, I want to enjoy it. I want to enjoy you. You are who I was made for. You're who we are all made for. Thank you that we're here. Thank you for all the folks that you've brought here today. Thank you for those that are watching online or will be. And I pray that we could all enter into your presence today, that we could find our hearts communing with you. Come before you now. And everyone else that's here, hey, you have access to God the Father. Don't let anything stop you. He paid such an enormous price to give you access to him. No matter where you're at, no matter what you've done or what's going on in your soul or in your heart, what are distracting you, you don't have to listen to shame. There is no condemnation if you're in Christ. You can come. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. What an amazing, amazing blessing and a privilege. So we come to worship him. Jump in. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise I could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, yeah, we live for you. Sing it out, holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and song we could ever sing worthy, worthy worthy of all the praise he could ever bring of every breath worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus a name above every other name only one who could ever say 
You're worthy of every breath you could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing it out right now. Holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up. Oh, 
God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I will fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Sing it again. Teach my song. So teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I will fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. You're my hope and stay. says create. just for yourself and Jesus, come before him, vulnerable, honest, 
naked, unashamed. Take a deep breath, relax. Relax into him. Be seated if you want. You can stay standing if you want. Whatever helps you get into a posture where you can worship Him and con have contact with Him, commune with Him the best. I could do to change your mind. 
rise from your throne like a river, like a river. Here I find myself in the sweetest embrace. It's a love that I could never earn. And it's only in this place that I am truly saved, surrendered to beauty and to and your mercy encovers me wherever I go yes Lord and your kindness it never ends oh Lord there's nothing I could do to change your about me nothing I could do your mercy and your mercy encovers me wherever I go and your kindness and never There's nothing I could do to change your mind. God, there's nothing I could do to change your mind. Oh, there's nothing I could do to change your mind about me. Your love is, your love is 
Thank you that your love holds us so secure. Thank you that it's so durable, it's so deep, it's infinite. Thank you that we can trust it. We can fall into it, know it's going to catch us. Thank you, God. We need that kind of love. Lord, would you speak to us today? Would you speak right to our hearts, right to where we're at? to use this time as a way to talk to your people. Tell us what's on your heart, what's on your mind. We're here to bless you, Lord. Lord, be blessed. You have so blessed us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. We'll kind of work our way back to our seats here. We've got a few announcements before we start studying through the Bible. All right, so um, we have another summer picnic coming up. So put that on your calendars if it's not on there already, July 24th. Wait, 24th? Oh, yeah, July 24th. That's right. I'm reading that right. Cool. Um, hopefully this time we'll be at the park right around the corner here by the zoo. Uh, last time the rain kind of chased us back inside, but... It was good hanging out with everybody. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, let's see. The next thing. I saw an email about this earlier this week. I didn't, I'm going to be honest. It said women's summer, and then I just checked out after that because I'm not a woman. So, But there's a women's uh, summer fall book club starting up in July. Uh, they're going to be weed, reading through... Man, I am getting old. That writing is really small. C.S. Lewis, Space Trilogy. So, you guys can get those books on Amazon. And it's going to be every... Is it every Saturday? Or once a month? Okay, so once a month. The f say, sorry, say that one more time. So you're going to read all three books in three months and talk about each book one day a month. The last book is really long, so you're going to have to really, okay. You have to read ahead on that last one. Okay. Yes, Vero. That's brilliant. Who doesn't want to save money? What did you say? Oh, and library. Okay. It's all kinds of avenues. So, uh, get those books and get involved with that. Uh, next week, 
Manjay, you're not here, right? He's, he's out. So we're not canceling church. But Nathan Hartman's going to be teaching. And then uh, we're going to have a worship leader, a guest worship leader, Larry Gifford. Um, he is a phenomenal, did I just say that right? Phenomenal guitarist, um, worship leader. He led worship at Eastside where Mike and I and Craig and Mary were at. Um, yeah, so he, is it bringing anybody with him or is it just him? Okay. He also plays mandolin, which is, yeah, he's fantastic. So stay tuned for that. Um, I believe that's all the announcements. So Mike's going to come up here and preach. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's turn to 1 Samuel 7. Yeah, uh, yeah we are. Nicole um, this morning got on a plane to go meet with her mom and sister. They do a girls' adventure weekend thing. Uh, well, it's like an adventure week. Um, they do this every couple of years or so, so that'll be fun. And then Noble and I are, uh, you hear that echo, echo, echo? Noble and I are going to be flying to California today right after this service where we will rendezvous with them at the end of the week. So it's Noble's birthday on Friday. It was Noble's birthday. He's eight years old. Eight years old. I know. He's very excited. So anyway, wish him a happy birthday when you see him. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit to get a head start at this. We're going to start at chapter 6, verse 19, and read all the way through chapter 7 so that we can get some context. Here we go. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70, 70 men of them, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he and to, and to, to whom shall he go up away from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath Jerium, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord, come down and take it up to you. And the men of Kiriath Jerium came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eliezer to have charge of the ark of the Lord. And from the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some 70 years, and all the house of Israel lamented or mourned after the Lord. This is verse 3 of chapter 7 now, if you're following along. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth, from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you there. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted on that day, and they said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people for Israel at Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not stop to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he might save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as, as below beth Car, which is about six miles or so south. Then uh, Samuel took a stone and, and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So... 
the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities of the Philistines had, uh, had taken from Israel were restored to Israel and Ekron to, uh, from Ekron to Gath. And Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah. And he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for that was where his home was. And there he also judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. There we go. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this passage. Thank you for this scripture. God, we are humbled before you. We're asking that you would speak to us. Lord, we're, we're trying to be brave and hear anything that you would want to say. Lord, we know it's... A, it's um, to come before you abandoned should have a feeling of awe and, and holy fear. So we come to you, Lord, open, open hands, ready to receive, knowing that you're a God of love, that you're good. So, Lord, please guide us, direct us through this passage. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, hey, the Andersons are back in the house. Yes. Good to see you guys. And then is James, is that James Dean? And his little, oh my gosh. Can we pass him, like, can we just pass him around during the whole? Um, okay. Yeah, you're like, yes, please. Yes, please. Um, okay. We've been moving through the book of Samuel on Sunday mornings. And in many ways, um, this passage speaks directly to our current context in America. Happy 4th of July weekend, by the way. And as usual, um, it's amazing to see how God moves us in Scripture to a certain place at a certain time that really does a great job of matching where we're at in our culture. This is one of those times. Um, we're joining together this, this weekend to celebrate our nation's birth. And in many ways, our great nation is certainly favored by God. We are blessed to be here in America, and we're blessed to have this country, a place where we can worship God. We're, at with, we're not afraid that police are going to storm the building right now and take us away for worshiping God. We've got freedom to do that. Our nation actually began in large part from a desire to be able to worship God without interference. That's, that's how America started. Um, the Church of England in England was a, kind of a church state type of a thing going on, a culture going on in England. In other words, most people in England had the idea that the church was their nation. To be born in England was to be born into the church of England. This is the Christian nation. But um, people, there's some other people that thought differently. People known as separatists or the Puritans, they had a very different idea. They believed that the church was a separate entity made up of a voluntary community. Okay? Separate from the, the, the nation that you're born in. So they left the Church of England and they started their own churches and they started worshiping in their own ways and, and according to what they found in the Bible and their own interpretation. This was really threatening. This was a threatening thing. Um, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth at the time, she, um, there, was, there was two branches of government. There was the political system and then there was the church. And there was great influence that she had because the church was involved. And so people dissenting from the Church of England felt like a dissent from the nation and from her political strength and her political power. And it was very threatening to other people as well. Um, she thought, like a lot of everybody else thought, that the church should include the entire nation, every person in England. So the Puritans and the separatists, they were seen as subversive, rebellious, and they began to be persecuted. So many of the Puritans and separatists, they got on a boat and they left for the new world. They came over. Um, a world in which people had the God-given freedom to worship God or not worship God without any interference. Again, the basic idea was that Christianity and one's national identity are not the same exact thing. 
That's the idea. Being a Christian gives one an allegiance to something higher than any government system, governmental system, higher than any king or queen, higher than any political system. The church is a separate community, or as the Bible calls us, we are resident aliens, and we are natives in a land that is not our home. Think of that. We're natives in a land that is not our home. Of course, the French Revolution um, in the 18th, uh, 18th century also um, added to this idea, this ultimate manifestation of the Enlightenment philosophy that added to this idea, this separation from church and state. And there is, there's pros and cons to that. There's pros and cons to that. Um, here's, here's the thing. Around 21,000 Puritans came over. Um, and they produced more than 16 million descendants here in this country. 16 million, although not the largest demographic that, of people that came over, they were extremely influential on society because they were by far the most literate of this new world. Um, they were huge on education. And so they set up schools for their own children to teach them how to read the Bible. That, that's how they learned to read, was by reading the Bible. And they wanted to teach their kids to interpret the Bible on their own without the help of clergymen. Okay? Uh, by the time of the War of Independence, there was about 40 newspapers in America, most of which were written by or contributed by the Puritans, the Separatists. They were influencing culture tremendously. They even started their own college. Maybe you've heard of it, Harvard University. Um, only six years after arriving here in the United States. Okay? So major in influence in how this nation got started. Now, whatever your read of American history is, everyone agrees that recently, I'm sure you would agree too, that recently Christianity has been in a sharp and steady decline here in America. This has clearly disrupted the very foundation of our moral order, right? Our ethics, our morals, our sense of identity, all of those things have been disrupted by this, uh, uh, you could say, attack against or decline from Christianity. Let me, let me, let me read you a few stats to give you some perspective here. In, in, uh, in 1940, church-going rates hovered above 40% in America. By the late 1950s, they were close to 50% in America. Okay. Um, religious identity increased more rapidly than usual as well. Church membership um, grew twice the amount of the population growth. Think of that. Church membership grew twice as much as the population was growing. In 1930, 47% of Americans were formally affi affiliated with a church denomination. 47%. That number rose to 69% by 1960. In fact, when this church, this, this church in Seattle, 19, uh, 1960, 1970, was exploding. Emmanuel, right here. This was the happening place to be. Thousands of people were coming in and out of this church. Um, the percentage of religious leaders rose. A poll that I found from 1957 found that 46% of Americans described the clergy as the group, check this out, clergy, people like me, as the group quote, doing the most good in our nation's common life. More than politicians, well, you know, businessmen, and more, more than labor leaders. Clergy doing the most good. Um, enrollments in seminary and Sunday schools increased steadily. There was a great surge in American church construction. Okay, I got some stats for that. Americans spent $26 million on sacred architecture in 1945. $409 million in 1950 building churches, and they spent $1 billion in 1960 building new churches. Okay? It was exploding. Scripture sales also soared. Um, the distribution of Bibles rose 140% um, between 1949 and 1953. Um, in the cultural arts, you remember all these great films, these New Testament films that were coming out. Um, epics like The Robe in 1953, Ben-Hur. You guys remember that 
1959. It's still a classic. If you haven't seen Ben-Hur, not the new one. See the old one. It's just incredible. Um, and Barabbas. A movie came out in the theaters. Barabbas, 1961. As well as Old Testament films like, films like The Ten Commandments. Right? 1956. All of this was flowing out of this era and coming into the culture. Uh, today, of course, the Christian landscape in America is a little different. To say the least. Today, more and more Americans are telling pollsters that churches should stay out of public life. That faith and religion should stay out of public life. In a 2002 uh, paper in the American Sociological Review, um, Michael Hout and Claude S. Fisher announced the startling fact that the percentage of Americans who said they had uh, n um, no religious preference at all, we call them nuns, that's what they're called, nuns, had doubled in less than 10 years, rising from 7% to 14% of the population. That trend has done nothing but accelerate in alarming rates. The 2020 census uh, reported that 23% of American, American adults, that's one in four people, declined to affiliate themselves explicitly with any religious body at all. And that keeps going up. Meanwhile, the major Christian uh, evangelical churches, the big mega churches, we are seeing scandal after scandal after scandal, failure, moral failure after moral failure, lowering Americans' view of, of, of the credibility of the clergy and church uh, at all. Um, I felt that in Seattle since moving to Seattle. All of this, of course, has changed society's notions of morals dramatically. Who are we? What are our ethics? Um, you, you guys remember, in the early 2000s, I found a poll that said that the majority of Americans were opposed to gay marriage in the early 2000s. Now, in 2020, transgenderism is well on its way to becoming the norm, to becoming a, nor a normal thing. Needless to say, to a Bible-believing Christian, our society is progressing in the wrong direction <laughs> morally and spiritually and for those of us that love our neighbors and love our land and love our, our country and, and love the people that are around us we we have to ask can we be saved can our nation come to Jesus can we uh, can, can there be a revival? Can all of those things happen? Can, how, does a, how does God get the heart of a nation? Well, in many ways, though the history of Israel is um, uh, very different than, especially the type of its religious and governmental system is vastly different from that of America. In many ways, though, this passage before us in chapter 7 shows us how God can renew the heart of a people. How God has the power to renew the heart of a people and what, how he can renew our hearts, how he wants to renew our, our hearts, and how we can play a role of leadership in this society around us. Um, we can learn so many profound things from this chapter, but I've boiled it down to four points. I think we can fit it all in four points. Here's what we're going to learn. One, a people or a person can only be saved from destruction when they realize just how totally sick they really are. That's got to happen. It has to happen. They need, um, they need to see just how, just how bad it is, okay? You know, when a doctor says to the patient, bluntly, you're, you're, you're going to die. If you don't change your habits, you're, gonna, you're going to die. Those, you, you know, we need that blunt kind of wake-up conversation, right? Secondly, they must clear away the other things that are stealing their passions, stealing their devotion, got to clear away the things that are siphoning off our passion and our worship for, to God, siphoning them off to other things or other people. Thirdly, um, we've got to come to Yahweh. We've got to make contact with Yahweh. We'll look into that. That's a huge. And fourth, one must re be rem we must remember constantly how God saved, how God is saving, and how he will always save. We have to remember this and bring this up. Those are our four points. Let's dive in. Number one, no one, no person, no nation, no culture, no one can come to God without a deep realization of how sick they actually are. It's not fun, but it's got to happen. 
That's what the story, that's what the story of Samuel has been building up to this point, if you remember. Israel has been slowly realizing just how bad they are, just how bad the situation actually is. Um, the book began with a woman named Hannah, uh, a name that means favored, favored one. And yet, this favored one, we find out right away that she's barren. She can't have children. In that culture, that was a curse. So here's a favored one who was cursed. And it soon becomes evident that the narrator is using Hannah's situation and story as a metaphor of the spiritual state of the nation, of Israel. Like Hannah's name, Israel has been favored by Yahweh as a nation we real, we, we, you can read about that in Genesis chapter 12. They're destined to bear fruit, to bear offspring, to be a great nation, so that God through them can bless the entire world, can bless the rest of the world. That's the plan. And yet, when we start Samuel, we find this favored nation is barren spiritually. They're falling apart from the inside out. They're corrupt. Rather than transforming the land of Canaan for Yahweh, claiming it for Yahweh, that's the idea of the functional uh, uh, use of mankind in Genesis chapter, chapter 1 and chapter, uh, chapter 2, that we would be image bearers. In other words, images uh, bearing God's name, bearing God's image set up in, in a land that would tell the world this land belongs to him. Instead of doing that in the land of Canaan, Israel is led astray from Yahweh. They're seduced to worship the gods of the land that they came to conquer. They're led astray. Their hearts are led astray by foreign gods, causing them to worship Yahweh as um, one of many options rather than their one and only. Compounding this, their leadership structure is so corrupt to its root. You remember Eli and his sons Hophni and Phinehas who used their position as priests um, the, a priest was meant to ascribe honor and weight remember that that play on words that the that the writer, the writer uses kabod he uses that to talk about the weight of Eli he's he, in other words he's been siphoning the sacrifices the best of the sacrifices to make himself weighty literally Rather than using that to give the weight and the honor and the import to God, that's, what all, that's what's been happening. Um, they use the people's sacrifices as a way to drive people further away from Yahweh rather than to bring them forward so that they could take it for their own gain. And also taking advantage of women and people that came to be close to Yahweh and close to God and worship Him. They were just as corrupt as it could be. On top of this, the Philistines... A nation superior geopolitically, they were strategically placed in a much better position in the land where they could receive much better technology, weapons, those types of things. They basically treated Israel as resident slaves. They were in charge. They were constantly a nuisance to Israel. The nation was falling further and further and further away from Yahweh. And you get this kind of rhythm when you read through the first part of the book because God sends, uh, God sends a man of God to warn Eli. Hey, you're corrupt, repent. That doesn't happen. God then tells Samuel, this little boy being raised in the, in the, in the tabernacle under Eli, God tells Samuel, I'm going to do something, I'm going to take this leadership structure out. Samuel tells Eli that still nothing changes. And finally, in chapter 4, the unthinkable happens in the battle of Aphek. In one infamous day of battle, 34,000 Israelite soldiers die. Their leadership was all killed. Eli and his sons were, all died in one day. And worst of all, worst of all, the ark of God, the literal manifestation of God's presence and the sign of God's divine favor was captured by the enemy, by the Philistines, and taken, on this, taken into their territory. That's chapters five, six, five and six, and here we come back. So we're ending that uh, in seven. Look at words can't express how spiritually and nationally devastating it was for the ark 
to be captured by the Philistines. The ark represented so much. It represented, for one thing, the original covenant that God had cut with them as a nation at the foot of Mount Sinai when they were rescued out, uh, um, out of Egypt in the Exodus. It was placed in a tent that intentionally, intentionally resembled what? You guys remember those that have been here? What, what did the tabernacle look like? Someone say the Garden of Eden. It was a tent, but it was decorated like the Garden of Eden. It was the place, in other words, the ark represented God's presence in the heart of the Garden of Eden, the tabernacle, the tent, and Israel would weekly move into God's presence through sacrifice. In other words, in Genesis, we see mankind being cast east, right? Well, weekly, they would simulate a return, going west into God's presence. That's what it meant for them. It meant restoration, reconciliation. It meant a, a symbol of God fixing the big problem. It was placed there so that they could dwell, again, simulate dwelling with, together with God in perfect rest, wholeness, and contentment. It was the place where the nation would come to inadequately but genuinely try to restore their relationship with God. And now it was gone. It had left. But upon its capture, it had unleashed unprecedented judgment and wrath on the land of the Philistines. Paul went into detail about what that looked like. It was gruesome. It was horrible. And, and it comes back into the land of Israel. Remember, on its, on its own power. It comes back into the land of Israel. And it says that when the people saw the ark come back into the Israelite territory, that Israel rejoiced. They rejoiced. They were so happy. Until they looked inside of it. <laughs> They approached it, they popped open the lid, and they looked inside, and to their shock, the Lord broke out on them also, killing them. They were in effect, you know, the shock of this, the Lord lashes out at them also. You, the, you know, the point is, there's no difference between us and the Philistines. That's the point of the, of the, that's the, point of the text. God's judging the Philistines, God's judging us. Yahweh was breaking out on everyone at this point, to the point where they say, uh, you can read in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 20, this is what they say, this, and this is, what's, is what gives us the clue. Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? In other words, who is able? That, you, my friends, that right there is the question of the Old Testament. Who is able? Psalm, uh, Psalm 24, 3 through 4 says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Who, he who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Apparently no one in Israel at this point. He broke out against them too. Can you feel the dilemma and the tension in the text? Here it, here it is. Let me describe it to you. What we so desperately need, what we're longing for, what we've got to have is the very thing that we cannot have. God is holy and we are not. That is the tension of the Old Testament. God is holy and we are not. We, they are just as deserving, Israel is just as deserving as judgment as their enemies, the Philistines. They're just as deserving. The ark, the presence of God, here's, here it is. The ark, the presence of God is both the promise and the problem. That's the tension you feel when you read through the Old Testament. It's both the promise and the problem. It's what, it's what mankind needs on the one hand. I, the answer to our problems is the promise of the presence of God. And the cause of all of our problems is the absence of the presence of God. It's both. It is the answer to all of man's greatest problems. And it is the problem causing all of our problems. The loss of the presence of God, the very thing that humans were made for, is the driving plot of the Old Testament 
and of the human soul. We need God, and yet nobody in this room is worthy of him. We need him desperately to live. He's what you were made. He is hand in glove. He is what you were made to, he is who you were made to be with. And yet you have no business coming before him. If you do, if you were to come up and pop open the lid in your, in your own self, his wrath would break out on you. God is holy and we are not. Can you feel it? It's as if the Old Testament is constantly pushing that question on you. How do unholy people come into contact, come into the presence with what they so desperately need? The source of their life, God himself. In the words of our text, the men cry out, who can stand before this holy God? That's the point. Exactly. See, the Israelites... <clears throat> could no longer compare themselves to the Philistines and say, well, at least we're not them. That was gone now. Now there's equal footing. We are just as, as worthy of, of God's wrath. Um, Paul, the, uh, Paul the Apostle puts it this way. He says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the same stuff. You do the same things. <laughs> when, when, when I was first a pastor in Palm Springs, there was this homeless community out in the desert. There was this grove of trees, and there was this homeless community, and... Um, they were all these ex-construction workers, and so they, they had built these, they had grabbed all these old pallets and wood and scraps that they had found, and they had built this elaborate, like, homeless little city in this grove of trees. It was really, they did an amazing job. And Nicole and I, before we were married and then after we were married, her and I would go out there, and we would hold Bible studies at this homeless camp. And uh, we, would, we, would, uh, we knew them all by name. They all had street names. There was a guy named Jingles. There was a guy named Guy. Um, his girlfriend's name was Sherry. And we, we would go out there. There was lots of others. And we even had a, a secret code. Because it was these grove of trees. And we would come out and we'd have to say, Eagle! And then we'd hear, we'd hear Guy's voice go, Come on back, Mike! <laughs> and so no, no, Nicole and I would go in there. And we'd go into their place, and it was this, we would army crawl. No kidding, true story. Her and I would, with our Bibles, we would crawl through this elaborate maze, and in the middle of this, like these tunnels, completely enclosed, completely enclosed with wood and everything, we would tunnel through, and in the middle, there was a larger, like, room, like hobbit hole, where all the homeless people would get in a circle, and we would take them through the book of John. Yeah. It was super fun, and we would bring them food, Nicole would dress their wounds when they needed it, and things like that. It was just such a, it was a fun way to date. But um, one, of these, one of the things about these guys is that they were so judgmental of each other. I remember they would say, when, when one of them would stumble off and leave, they would say, that guy right in there is a drunk. And I'd say, you're drunk right now. You're, but he's, he's really bad, they would say. And we would talk to them, and they would say the same. They were always talking about each other behind their backs, and they were all do, involved in the same stuff. They were all doing the same thing. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourselves. I find that society is a lot the same way. We're always looking at them or vilifying the other. But at the root of it, we all have problems, Right? My problems just might be more socially acceptable than others. But we're all, according to the Bible, according to Paul, he says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh people, you who judge those who practice such things and yet, do, and yet you do them to yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? You know the famous passage, Paul goes on to say, no one is worthy, not even one. No one seeks God, not even one. We're all on equal footing, whether you're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. 
We're all on equal footing before God. We deserve judgment. The first step, no matter where you're at, the first step, no matter where, what nation we're in, the first step is for the heart to be humbled, to be tenderized, to be pulverized away from the hardening effects of pride. That's got to happen. And unfortunately, sometimes that only happens in a crisis. When the bottom falls out. When there's real perspective given. uh, The women, I hope you guys join Nicole this summer and read that book by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was famous for saying that God screams at us in our pain. It's... God screams at us in our pain. It's often when we get the the greatest perspective is when things are, when we're out of control, when things are not going according to plan, when the unthinkable happens, we get that perspective. Why? Because God resists the proud. He resists the 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 oh them over there but that guy's really bad oh but at least i'm not like that oh them out there he resists all that and he embraces the humble in other words unfortunately in our land churches are known for people who are proud judgmental churches by definition, are filled with people who have been humbled to their core. Their hearts have been tenderized, pulverized, humbled to their core. We have no business looking down on anybody else. We cannot do it. Do you understand that? And when we do, because we often do, it's where our hearts go, we should use that as an opportunity to immediately repent. To say, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. I remind myself of how spiritually lost I am. It makes us refreshingly approachable. That's where Israel is at. They're finally able to see. They have this moment of, okay, wow, we're not worthy of God either. When we meet somebody in Seattle, we should have that attitude of, I'm not worthy of them either. I can't pop the lid off that thing and look in either. I dare not approach God either in and of myself. That's number one. Secondly, They also needed to be willing to put away the foreign gods, like I said earlier, that were stealing away their passions and stealing away their devotion, their devotion to Yahweh. This is how idolatry works. Let me read the passage. This is verse 3 of chapter 7. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if if you are returning to the Lord, look at the um, exclusive, total, extreme language here, with all your heart. If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart... Then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they served only the Lord. I'll tell you in a second. Um, the cru- but let me, let me get a running start first. The crucial thing to realize when you're talking about matters of the heart because that's, anytime we're dealing with idolatry, we're, you need to understand, we're not actually talking about statues or things that are external things. The reason things sell, the reason certain parts of our economy are soaring, the reason advertisement works is because it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. It's beyond something you need when it comes to idolatry, when it comes to things that you're worshiping. What what is worship in the Bible? It's ascribing ultimate worth to something. When you're saying, this is worth my thought, my passion, my time, my effort, more than Yahweh, more than God, that's called an idol. This is a matter of the heart that we're dealing with. And when we're dealing with this, we need to know that they steal our passion. An idol always promises to meet a need. Listen, this is super important. An idol always promises to meet a need that you really do have. Really important for you to understand that. That you really do have. That's what makes, that's what makes idols so alluring. We do have actual needs. In the case of Israel, and to get to your question um, 
Renee, Baal and Ashtaroth were part of the same family of gods worshipped for fertility in the land of Canaan. They were of the fertility family of the gods that were worshipped there in the land of Canaan. In that society, their security, their sense of safety, a real need, something they really have need for, it all revolved around fertility. It was, for one thing, and, and most telling, uh, Canaan was an agrarian society, and their survival was completely dependent on their crops, on the fertility of their crops. Therefore, they would worship Baal and Ashtaroth in hopes that they would send rain or keep away pests, cause their crops to go rich and have a rich harvest. If, if not, they were dead. People would die. So idols or false gods demand worship. What is worship? Devotion. Devotion or passion ultimate worth being put on them they demand it in exchange for a met need i will meet your need you give me your passion but they can't really fulfill that need in its deepest sense in fact all idols do is simul they they um they aggravate the need more okay they make you thirstier they make you hungrier for what you need all they can do is simultaneously um is, is simultaneously fulfill that only serves to inflame the need even more. And this is, the, this is how addiction works. This is how idolatry works. Um, addiction would be a modern way of saying, uh, of describing the Bible's description of idolatry. The alcoholic keeps going back to the bottle because it promises to depress pain and regret and things that are hurting them emotionally, and yet it only ends up causing more especially if you end up hurting people that you love while you're under the influence. It causes more regret, more pain, which says, come on back, to numb it more. And on and on and on and on it goes. Uh, pornography s simulates a place of complete acceptance. Come as you are. You are seen and you are wanted. We're not ashamed of you here. The pornography world says. You can come with the weirder desires, the better. We celebrate who you are. But the very behavior engaged in causes so much shame and embarrassment in the human soul, making you want to replace the shame with more thrill. And on and on and on it goes. This is, this is the Bible would call this, this, this what we've got going on, a, a spiritual disease called, called idolatry. And as Spurgeon said, our hearts are idol factories. The Bible says that we, you are made to worship. It's what you're doing. You're, you are wor if, the moment you stop worshiping, according to the Bible, this is biblical anthropology, the study of human beings, the moment, the moment you stop worshiping is the moment you stop being human. You are hoping for something's getting you out of bed in the morning. Something is making you keep going. Or someone or some things are making you get out of bed or inspiring you or motivating you to move and work and live. You're hoping for something either in the future or whatever it is. It's what drives the economy. It just drives you. We are hope-filled creatures. We are worshiping something. In the Bible, the question is, what are you worshiping? Through the judgment of God, the Israelites are finally seeing that the presence and protection of God is what they've been searching for all along by worshiping the Baals and the Ashtaroth. For the presence of God is where true fulfillment is. In his arms, uh, in, God, God, in God's arms is the embrace that you're looking for in every set of arms. We make idols out of our marriages, out of our friendships, out of, our, out of any relationship. We make idols out of our careers. Out of our, when we make an idol out of our career, it could be, I want to be known. I want to be, I want to be noticed. I want to be appreciated. It's a real need. So we work tirelessly to get the accolade. 
nonstop, burning the candle at both ends just to get the, the blessing, the attaboy, I see you. Wow, where would this company be without you? Where would we be? All of that. Go, and it, what, what are we, what, what's going on there? It's so subtle. So Samuel tells them to do something drastic. To cut off their soul's source for love and acceptance and all of those things. He says, stop trusting in them. Put them away. And put all your passion, all your devotion, all your dependence, all your worship, all your ultimate worth onto Yahweh where it belongs. This was Augustine's biggest grid that he looked at the Bible through. He, he basically said all of Christianity is about a, a prioritizing of your loves. And all of your problems is because the priority of your loves are out of whack. You love your wife more than God. You love your job more than God. You love your money more than God. You love your stuff more than God. You love your family more than God, your children more than God. All of those things are great things, but great things, when they become ultimate things, become destructive things. That was, that was Augustine's formula. Good things becoming ultimate things equals destructive things. Anything, he would go on to say, anything we worship more than God will distort, will tweak, will hurt us, will warp us. And the more and more we center ourselves and make him priority and center ourselves on God, the more healing we'll experience, the more health, the more our relationships will be restored, the more order will come into our lives, the more glorifying to God we will be, the better citizens and residents that we'll be, the better neighbors we'll be, the more we center on Yahweh. That's what, that's what Samuel's saying here. He's saying, put away the Baals and the Ashtaroths, cut yourself off from those, those things, and put your, make him your ultimate, your only. The other gods are stealing our passion for Yahweh. The gods in your life, church, the other gods in your life, they steal your passion for him. Dividing our hearts. You might still, and sometimes we settle for, well, at least I have some passion for Yahweh. Right? Right? That's where Israel was at. They didn't stop worshiping Yahweh. He was just one of many that they worshiped. We do that. I love God. I'm a Christian. But I also really, really need this. And really need uh, my spouse to notice me and to always stroke my ego. Or really need my kids to behave exactly the right way. Or really need... And he's one of many. We go to, and this is what is so sneaky about this. We go to church. We worship Yahweh. But is he ultimate? If you, and here's what's so unfortunate. This is, why, this is why I think sometimes God uses a crisis to shake us awake. Because this kind of living makes us sleepy. We feel quite comfortable. I think comfortability is probably one of the greatest enemies of the church. We feel quite comfortable because we are worshiping God. We go to church. We do all these other things. But we're just trying to survive. We're just trying to get through week to week. I'm just trying to get through, you know, all of those things. And it just becomes a routine day in, day out. And what happens? Our passion's gone. Our drive. Our passion for God. So sometimes... God sends or uses a crisis of some sort to say, okay, and we, that's when we realize, oh, that's right, I remember now. The only thing that matters is him. And he's what gives everything else matter and import. The reason my kids are so significant is because of you. The reason my spouse is so lovely is because of you. The reason my job is so wonderful and fulfilling is because of you. Oh, now I remember, now I get it. And things align and we come home. Repentance is absolutely, this is the New Testament word for this is repentance. It's absolutely necessary. So, and, and amazingly, Israel complies. They get rid of their idols and they commit themselves to Yahweh. But look, it's still not enough. It's still not enough. Repentance, don't get me wrong, 
for us to come home to Jesus, for us to home, come home, for your passion to return, if you're living in a, you know, no one wants to live in a passionless marriage, right? It's not, it's like, like your roommates. There's no passion. That's a problem, right? Um, no one wants to live in a passion, passionless relationship with Yahweh either. How do we deal with that? Well, it means something's taking your passion. Something else or some things else or someone's else is siphoning your passion. So we need to repent. But notice, it's still not enough. Necessary, but not enough. Look what happens. The problem still remains. They've gotten rid of their things. They've separated their hearts, but the problem's still there. God is, God is holy, and they're still not. Their sins still prohibit them from access. They've got to come before God. They've got to come before Yahweh, but they can't, which means they need someone else. Third point is, come before Yahweh, listen, but never alone. You have to hear that. Third point is, n- number one, or number two, repent. Number one, realize how sick you are. Number two, repent of the, the other things that are stealing your passions. Reorder your passion to Yahweh, right? Get rid of the Ashtaroths, the Baals. Number three, come to Yahweh, but never come alone, ever. Let me explain. Verse 5, then Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah, listen, and I will pray to the Lord for you. Do you hear that? Really important. Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah, they drew water, they poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on the day and said, we have sinned against the Lord. What happened? And Samuel Judge the people there at, at, uh, of Israel at Mizpah. What does that mean? It means he, he held them accountable. This is what was going on at Mizpah. Samuel would come to them and say, you guys have been worshiping the Baals and the Ashtaroths instead of Yahweh and Yahweh alone. And they pour out water and they fast and they say, oh my gosh, we've sinned. And, and Samuel goes to Yahweh and says, oh God, help them. Be, have, be merciful to them. See? And then he would go back and say, and... You guys had these corrupt leaders, and they were leading you astray. Oh, Lord, we've sinned. And Samuel would go to Yahweh. God, have mercy on them. They're repenting. They're, at, they're confessing. That's what was going on. There was a judging, a, a truth and love happening. There was judgment, but there was intercession. There was truth, but there was mercy. There was love, all revolving around one person. Who is it? It's what the book's named after. Say it out. Samuel. Samuel is key. He is key. Come before Yahweh, but never alone. I'm yelling because this is really important. That's why I'm yelling. I'm not mad. I'm passionate. That's why I tell my wife. Are you mad? No, just passionate. So Samuel took a nursing lamb. Oh, wait, wait. Plot thickens. So look. The Philistines, verse 7, when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel were having this come to Jesus moment at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And look what the people do. So the people, they come to Samuel. They come to Samuel and they say, don't cease crying out to the Lord for us on our behalf. That He may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb, offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord, and Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. So basically, the scouts of the Philistines, they see that Israel's having a weak moment. They're like, now's a good time to charge in. They're repenting. They're crying. They haven't eaten food. They're fasting. You know, hey, let's strike now. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and drew them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out. They start partaking in Yahweh's victory. They go out from Mizpah to pursue the Philistines and struck them as far below beth Here's what's going on. The people of Israel can't just come before God. We just learned that in chapter 6, Right? They tried. Didn't work. 
David's going to learn the same lesson in 2 Samuel chapter 6. He's going to try and God says, I don't care that you're David. Don't mess with me. I'm holy. Uh, I, there's, a, you know, there's a wildness to the Lord. I'm, I'm on the C.S. Lewis kick, thanks to Nicole's idea. What, did, what, did, uh, what was said about Aslan in the Narnia series? He's good, but he's not safe, right? He's wild. Aslan's good, but he's not safe. He's not, God is not someone that you walk in and you smack him on the back and say, what's up, man upstairs? That is not how the Bible describes a relationship with God. We dare not come before him alone. Alone. So Samuel, like Moses before him, this is a, and I, I'm going to bring this up to show you this is a pattern and a precedent in the Bible that leads to you. Like Moses before him, he acts as a mediator bef- between them and God. They come before God. They pour out their confession. Samuel judges them. That means he points out more mistakes. And he says, you guys are guilty of this. Then you did this. And because you did this and this happened, the people come clean about it. And he would intercede for them. This is exactly what Moses did in a very similar instance. Do you remember the the golden calf incident? This is Exodus 32. Look what happens in Exodus 32. This is verse 7 through 14. Just listen. You'll you'll hear very similar language. And the Lord said to Moses, go down. You ready for this? This is God. Go down for your people. Okay. Anyone with kids knows there's trouble right here. And your wife or your husband says, did you hear what your, ch- what your kid did? This is God saying, go down for your people whom you brought up out of, of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way, quickly out of the way that I commanded them. In other words, I just rescued them. I just did this. I just parted an ocean. For them to come out of Exodus. I just cut covenant with them. And they quickly. These are your gods, O Israel. uh, They say they have made for themselves a golden calf. And they worshipped it and sacrificed to it. And said, these are your gods, O Israel. Who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses. I have seen this people and behold. It is a stiff-necked people now therefore leave me alone that i that my wrath may burn hot against them and i'm going to consume them in order that i can make a better nation out of you god's mad this is emotion this is betrayal this is hurt i've heard so many people say oh this was god testing moses that is nowhere in this text you, will not, you have to impose that on the text to come to that conclusion. The clearest reading is that this is how God felt. This is, what it, this is what it meant. But look, but Moses, watch what happens. Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember, this is, he's, he's interceding. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and with and, and all this land I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken. So God said, okay, fine. Look what else happens. The Lord said to Moses, so this is later. Then the Lord says to Moses, depart Go up from here, and you and all the people um, that I've brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. I will drive out, I'll even drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I'll drive out all of those guys. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm not going with you. I will not go with you, lest I consume you because you're a stiff-necked people. In other words, you guys are so unfaithful. I know what's going to happen. You guys go. I'll set you guys up real nice, but I'm not going. 
And when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. It reminds me a lot of the language in Samuel. They mourned after the Lord when after he destroyed them or judged them. And he said to him, this is Moses. Listen, Moses, so Moses goes to work. He intercedes. If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us that makes us distinct from all other people? Is it not your presence that makes us different? That makes us holy from every other people in the face of the earth? And here's the punchline, you guys. This is what I'm getting to. Listen. And the Lord said to Moses, listen, listen, listen. Tune in for this part. This very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you for you have found favor of my sight in other words I am going to act favorably for sinful stiff necked chronically spiritually diseased people because of you I'm going to have favor on someone because of your favor you guys This is the bedrock of Christianity. This is it. This is the same pattern we find in in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7. Look, so Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. It doesn't say, and the Lord answered Israel. The Lord answered Samuel. Samuel. Who did the Lord answer? Samuel. What did Samuel do? Samuel offered sacrifice. Do you see what's happening here? The people approached Yahweh through the sacrifice of Samuel. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound, are we getting into New Testament stuff right now? The people could come to Yahweh only through the sacrifice of Samuel. The people could get what they needed, the presence of God, that they were barred from having. They bridged this gap through Samuel. You guys, this is Christianity. This is the entire point. Christians approach God only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is what the Old Testament is pointing to here. Christians are right with God. We are right with God, but only through the sacrifice of someone else, through the favor of someone else, Jesus, who God has favored. In fact, it is impossible for you to approach God. It is impossible for you and I to be right with God without coming through Jesus. What did Jesus say? Truly I say to you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. This is what Paul means when he constantly uses the term that we are, for Christians, that we are in Christ. This is the power of your life. If you're a Christian, this is the power of your spiritual success, of your growth. You are in Christ. You claim, in other words, I'm claiming Christ's righteousness as my own. I dare not come on my own righteousness. I don't come because I'm better than them out there or because I was born in a certain place or because whatever makes me distinct or I'm Apple and you're PC or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. I come, I, I claim the righteousness of Christ as my own. If you come today and you take this, of this, these elements, that's what you're saying. I'm coming to Yahweh because of him. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Listen, Moses and Samuel and Jesus have a ton in common. They all served, as, they all served multiple roles in their leadership structure. They all acted as judges of Israel. Moses judged Israel. Samuel judged Israel. Jesus is the cosmic judge of the world. They all serve the role as priests. Samuel is a priest. Moses 
acted priest-like. But Jesus does so much more. Listen, only Jesus is judge, priest, but only Jesus can also become the lamb who sacrificed himself for us to appease the wrath of God on our behalf. That's only Jesus. Others could sacrifice lambs pointing to Jesus, but Jesus is, is saying, I am, the, I am the sheep that became the sacrifice. And the veil was rent. What does that symbolize on the cross? The veil was rent. It means the barrier between us, the holy, the, the, the profane and the holy has been ripped. We're welcome to come in now through Jesus, through the veil of his flesh, as Paul puts it, through Jesus. It, he is the solve to the how do I get what I need but I can't have dilemma of the Old Testament. Only, only through Jesus. Okay, final point. I know, I'm back. Final point. Samuel set up a stone of remembrance to remember the day that they were saved. Uh, verse 12. Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. Um, when looking upon this stone forever and ever, Israel would now always remember two things, simultaneously two things. One, their failure. One, their failure, their sickness. You want to know why? If you look back to chapter 4, verse 1, and chapter 5, verse 1, it was at the town of Ebenezer, or the territory, or the space, or whatever it was, of Ebenezer, that the ark was taken into captive because of their sin. It reminded them of their loss, their, their ga the gap between them and God, this whole thing that, that, that made a crisis happen. It reminded them of their sin. And yet, in the Hebrew language, the word Ebenezer sounds like, it's a play on words in Hebrew, but it sounds like stone of help. It's also the place where God helped them, saved them. That's exactly what communion is. Communion is a dual reminder to us. When you come, the cross reminds us of two things at the same time. One, it reminds you and I of how bad you are. Even on your best day, no matter how spiritual you become or, or whatever it is, on your best day, Jesus, the only way to save you, the only way to get you to heaven, the only way to restore your relationship with God, the only way was to send Jesus as a sacrifice for your sins. That was it. And yet, at the same time, communion, the cross, reminds you that you're so loved that he would actually do it. He did the cost benefits and he said it's worth it. She's worth it. He's worth it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross for you. That, see, that's what I'm, I was telling, Paul and I were talking about sermons. We were saying, you know, basically, I didn't say this, but sermons are like a good Asian meal. They're sweet and sour. Because that's the gospel. On the one hand, they're sour. They remind you of how bad you are. But they're so sweet. The gospel is so sweet. It's my hope every time you come to this church that you, that you leave feeling worse than you ever came in and yet that you leave feeling more loved than you ever dared to imagine because that's the only thing that will save you. That's the only thing that will save you and that's what communion does. It is our Ebenezer. Okay, back to America. What do we do? Can this nation be saved? Yeah, um, but I'll just be frank with you. I, I, think, I think it'll get worse. I don't see a revival happening without some kind of a crisis or something. I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't, see, I don't see any of these trends getting uh, better necessarily. I, I think they're going to be more augured in. Not yet. So what, so what do we do? Well, look what Samuel did. Samuel... He faithfully served in the tabernacle day in and day out until they were ready to hear it. We don't have record of him out on the streets on a soapbox screaming at people. It was when they were, their hearts were shattered. They mourned after the Lord that Samuel came and said, hey, okay, and then he was blunt. Then he told them the truth. 
You have gods in your life. You need to repent of these gods. You need to do this. You need to do that. And hey, I will come for you. That, if there's a, how are we going to be leaders in this, in this city, in Seattle? Hey, faithfully serve. Love the Lord faithfully. Love people faithfully. And when friends or when the city or when an, an individual in your life when that crisis happens, when they're softened before God, that may be an opportunity for you to be more blunt and say, look, I know someone who's, been to, who's gone to God on your behalf. You're not worthy of him. You're not worthy of him. You know, whoever said, I think it was, I don't know if it was St. Francis of Assisi or not. That, I know the quote's attributed to him, but that's never been proven. Uh, the, the quote that says, preach the gospel, but only use words if necessary. It's got to be one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. It's just so stupid because, okay, how many people were getting crucified under Rome? Lots. Jesus was not the only one. Someone had to actually use their words to say, but that guy is different. He's the son of God who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. That came from a mouth. You've got to speak. You have to speak the truth in love. Uh, Romans chapter 10. How shall people believe unless, unless they hear? It's real. I mean, Paul gets super logical. And how can they hear unless someone is sent? You have been sent to Seattle. So be faithful. Serve. And when the time comes, speak up. Speak up with truth and love. With both judgment, with brutal truth, but love, mercy, intercession. What else am I supposed to say? We as Christians, also, by the way, if you understand this message, that we're all, that God is an equal opportunity judge. No one can crack that lid and look in there. Uh uh. What does that do for us as Christians down here? We cannot look at those people out there. We cannot and judge them, and look down on them, or thumb our nose in them, or feel superior to them. If that's how we feel, we're missing the entire point. And they will know it. And they will stay away. No one likes that. Do you like feeling like you're misunderstood, and judged, and looked down on from someone who knows better than you? Of course you don't. But only when we Christians understand that we're not here because of merits of our own, we're just as sick, we're just as dirty, we're just as filthy, but God saved us. We have come to God through someone else, and now you can too. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter what political party someone identifies with. It doesn't matter uh, how confused someone might be. It doesn't, all of those things don't matter anymore, because I used to be confused in my own way. I came, I'm here through, on behalf of someone else. That's the only reason I'm a Christian. That's got to change your disposition towards the world on the, out there. It has to. So, we only come to God and experience God's favor because of Jesus. It's 12.02. Let's stand up. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember. Do this to remember. He took the cup likewise and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what our time is today. Remember two things. You didn't get here alone. You had to have help. That was Jesus. And that he loved you enough to help you at great cost to himself. Come on up when you're ready. I will wait for you there. Down on
on my knees where I met you. I'll give you all of my cares. Find the grace to hold on to now. I'm calling for you. from the world and its violence it left me broken and bare I need to hear you in the silence now I'm calling for you My beating heart will pour out a symphony. Hallelujahs in the morning, hallelujahs in the night. I will wait for you as long as I. where I met you. Life is a war fought with tears, and you are the strength I hold on to now. I'm calling for you. Calling and bring 
your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. cross as you wait for the crown and tell the world of the treasure you found tell the world of the treasure Thank you, God. We love you. Lord, we come to you through Jesus, only through him. We dare not come alone. And thank you that we are in Christ. We've been adopted in Christ. We're justified in Christ. We have all the benefits and every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. We're complete in Christ. And thank you, God, for that identity, the new identity that we have. We love you, Lord. I pray that we'd go out from here and be Samuels to the world. Tell the world about you. Serve them faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be dispersed. See you next time. Hey, you're not going to want to miss Larry Gifford. You guys, he's an incredible musician, incredible uh, guitarist, and uh, a great worship leader. Come, bring some friends. It'll be a great time.